Welcome to VIV Today, the daily podcast from the newsroom of business in Vancouver. I'm Kirk LaPointe, publisher and editor-in-chief. On Saturday, the BC Liberals elected Kevin Falcon as their new leader, succeeding Andrew Wilkinson. Falcon returns to politics, where he had risen to be deputy premier and finance minister earlier after a decade in the private sector, where he was uh, an executive in the development business. He's going to contest Wilkinson's Vancouver quote genesis as soon as the sitting NDP government calls an election. But meantime, I want to get some initial reflections on his leadership campaign and on his leadership strategy today. And I welcome back to the podcast, the new opposition leader, Kevin Falcon. Good to see you. Thanks very much, Kirk. Good to be here. So listen, um, when you won, um, who did you first phone? Um, well, I was actually this, you'll get a kick out of this actually, because I was in a hotel room because they asked us to, you know, stay in the hotel room and then they would call us, uh, you know, when, when they needed us to come down. And so, uh, ironically, I, I didn't, the TV that I, the TV set I had in my room didn't have global one. So I actually couldn't see any of the results. So I get a text message from someone and they're like, holy cow, great first ballot result. And I'm like, what first ballot result? I, I didn't know anything about this. And so then, you know, finally we dialed up and, and got hold of somebody and they're like, okay, you go here and we got it on the phone. And then uh, once I saw the 47%, I knew it was over. Mathematically, it was, you know, the win was done. And uh, so I, I felt, you know, really good about that. But uh, it was uh, it was kind of weird being so separated from it. You know, everyone in the room knowing well before I even did. Well, you got to got to look online. That's where I was. Uh, now, listen. Uh, <laughs> before I did. But was there a was there a, a family member, a friend, a oh, mentor, sure. somebody that yeah. you called right away? Well, I was I was with my wife and my two daughters. Uh, my two daughters were busy playing some computer game that they love uh, in the yeah, hotel room. Yeah, yeah. Who cares? And, and I was with Trevor Halford, who's an MLA from South Surrey White Rock. So he was sort of uh, acting as my liaison because I wanted them to phone him to tell me as opposed to trying to phone me because I was worried my phone, you know, might explode or whatever. Um, so Sorry. that's who was in the room with us. Yeah. But but who did you phone out? I mean, uh, people call like they, they, there's somebody that means something to them. Right. And they can't all be in the room with you. They can't be all at the wall center with you. Is, was there somebody that you reached out to? Uh, not not that night, to be honest with you. Uh, well, I shouldn't say not at that point in the night, um, because really, uh, you know, to me, the, the family is the most important. You know, my wife and kids have been extraordinarily patient. Uh, well, I've gone through this process. My kids probably not fully understanding what this the whole thing was all about. They kind of knew dad was doing something weird where he disappear all the time in some kind of race. So, you know, when we walked into that room, I think my girls were a little bit like, oh my goodness, what's all this? And all this lights and clapping and people and you know, TVs and stuff like that. So I think it was, a, it was, it was, I was concerned about them mostly, to be honest with you. Um, now, after that happened, Kirk, then of course, you know, my phone exploded and I've got like over 200 texts and messages. My mailbox filled up two seconds. And so I, I still haven't got through all of them. I'm working my way through them. Just, you know, phoning people, talking to people, et cetera. The girls were, uh, were, were, how would I put it? They filled the role exactly right. They were all smiling. They were all, they didn't seem distracted. You know, they didn't, they didn't kind of look, where was, where's my phone? You know, that kind of thing. Didn't do yeah. any of that. That was good. Um, but a, a serious question here, like, how, how do you feel this last decade out of politics changed you? Mm -hmm. I think it's a really important question because, you know, if I look back, and I remember when I first ran, I was, you know, in my, I think I was 37 or 38 uh, when I first got elected. I was one of the youngest, if not the youngest cabinet minister in the government at the time. And I was just, a, you know, I, I was unmarried at the time. Uh, I, I just worked all the time. I just wanted to get stuff done, you know. Um, and, and so I was very, it, it, like, I was just a very much like, I'm, if I'm going to do this, I want to make sure I can feel like I got some things done. Because... I was a reluctant MLA. So Gordon Campbell and I, uh, I you know, when he first asked me to run, I was really not interested in being an MLA. I was interested in helping out, but I didn't want to give up a private sector career to go be an MLA. In those days, you know, people think back, MLAs got paid very, very little uh, back then. I think it was $68,000 a year and there was no pension. And uh, it wasn't a super attractive, you know, option for somebody sort of going into the prime years of their life in the private sector. And so, Ultimately, um, you know, I, I was really inspired by Gordon Campbell, his vision for the province. And I thought, you know, 
I'll, I'll do this as long as I can feel like I'm going to get some big things done. And so that's the approach I took into government. What's changed now, though, is this couple things. Um, first of all, I think, you know, getting married and having kids, you know, changes your perspective a lot. So yeah. I always say to people, you know, my principles have not changed for sure, you know, private sector economy and, you know, I think less red tape is better than a lot more red tape and lower taxes are better than higher, et cetera. But, but what has changed, I think, is my values. You know, my principles are the same. My values are a little different because I look at the world. Pardon me? Yeah, I look at the world through the eyes of my kids and I think about them growing up. What kind of society do I want them growing up? And over the last 10 years, especially, you know, in the last five years, not just because of the NDP government, but just even watching what's happening in the United States and around the world and this sort of increasing sense of divisionness, this racism, this people moving into tribes, if you will, and, and, and nobody listening to each other, but everyone yelling at each other. Uh, and I really thought to myself, my goodness, I've never seen a time where there is a, a more of a need for confidence and leadership in government at every level than I've seen, you know, really right now. And, and that's not to say that, oh, I'm some, you know, magic savior. I'm not trying to imply that at all. It's just that I thought to myself, you know, here I am in the private sector uh, and I'm loving it. I work for a great company and, and it's just been so fantastic. But I worry about what's happening in the province and I worry about my kids growing up knowing nothing but NDP governments. And I saw that movie before in the 90s and I really don't want to see that replayed again. Uh, here in, in 2022. So that, I think, was a real compelling reason why I just felt a need to step forward. And, and here's the important thing. When I said I was going to do this, Kirk, it was really going to be on my terms. And what I mean by that is my vision and what I think and where I think the party has to go. And, you know, I always remind people, go look at my launch speech. If you really want to know where Kevin Falcon wants to go with his party, look at what I said on day one because right. it's no different than what I'm saying today, because it was important to me that I was not going to make what I call the Aaron O'Toole mistake, where, you know, you run and pretend to be something. And then when you get elected, you then try to shift and be something else. To me, that's not authentic. And I'm not being critical directly of him. I'm just saying there's a perception issue there. And I wanted yeah. to be very clear that if I'm running this for this party, I want the world to really understand that we are going to be a party that is going to be much more diverse. We are going to attract more highly accomplished women into this party and make sure they feel welcome. We are going to make sure the LGBTQ community feels very, very welcome as part of our big tent. And I wanted to set that up, up front because I am not going to win and then have people come to me and say, I want to run for your party, and, but I want you to know I, you know, whatever. I don't like yeah. this or that. And I'll just yeah, remind yeah. them. Very clearly, that hobbled the federal leader. Um, I, I'm going to digress for a second. I mean, you yeah. talked about words and worries. Um, does what happened in Ottawa in the last couple of weeks with the trucker convoy worry you? Um, I, I think worry would be too strong a word. But, but I think we have to be careful on how we talk about that. Because, um, you know, there's, it's very easy to be smug and dismissive. Uh, about folks. But one thing I've learned crisscrossing this province and talking to a lot of people, Kurt, is there is a growing sense of frustration. And I'm not saying they're all the people that are in the conflict, but there is a growing sense of frustration that people feel like, you know, we really have done everything that's been asked of us. We've got over 92% vaccination rate. We've all gone, most of us have gone and gotten the double vax and the boost and all the rest of it. And I think people really want to understand what is the end of the line here, okay? Give us a timeline for when we know that this is coming to some kind of an end. And I think government has an obligation to do that, to set out that timeline. Because there is a frustration that I think you're seeing expressed in the trucker convoy. Now, some of them clearly have opinions and have attracted some extremist elements that are totally unacceptable and not at all representative. I would argue not of just all the majority of the truckers, but certainly the population at large. And I just want to make sure that as political leaders, we work on how we can bring people together as opposed to helping to stoke divisions. And that's something that I think about a lot. I don't so, want so to- think, So do you think the prime minister has, has uh, stepped over the line in the way he's characterized this? I would say the, the prime minister and the opposition leader and, op and members of both sides of the house just need to be careful of the language they use. Uh, right. In the sense that they, they, and I think I heard the prime minister actually the other day saying, look, he understands the frustration that people have. So his, I think his, his position 
seem to uh, be a little more understanding of some of the genuine frustration that's out there, uh, which I appreciated him saying, because I just think it's important for us to understand two years with everything we've gone through. Some people have lost their, their businesses. They've lost their homes. They've taken a huge, enormous hit financially, but there's also a, a big, big mental health uh, issue out there too, where a lot of people are struggling. And we have to be very sympathetic and careful about being a little too judgmental on people. That's at least that's my opinion. Yeah, sure. You talked Saturday night about uh, in your acceptance speech about the need for a private sector driven economy. But as, as you know, I mean, the pandemic has in some ways conditioned us, maybe even anesthetized us to a much more public sector driven one. I mean, receiving checks and getting support and subsidies and things can recondition you a little bit. How do you how do you wean people from that, do you think? Yeah, and that's why I said that. Uh, it was very purposeful. I thought very carefully about every word I wrote in that speech. Um, I want you to know this. The reason I said that is because I'm very concerned about what I'm seeing happening in British Columbia. Uh, we have an NDP government that has hired over 100,000 full-time bureaucrats into the province in the just in the time that they've been in government. And to give you an idea, that's almost a 30% increase in the civil service. And at $100,000 per you know, employee, because that's typically what it is when you include wages and benefits, we're talking like a $10 billion uh, added cost to government. Now, if you said to me, Kev, where are they going? And somebody told me, oh, don't worry, you know, Kevin, they're, they're mostly in the health sector. I'd say, oh, okay, you know, I can kind of understand that. But I want you to know this, that's not where they're, that's not where they're being hired. We've actually lost people in the healthcare sector, and yet we keep growing the size of government. And if I even could see, well, you know, we're getting much better results, things are happening a lot faster, and you can see a lot of improvement in some of the things that we all are concerned about, whether it's street homelessness or uh, addiction overdoses or housing supply or just pretty much anything. Um, then I would say, okay, well, maybe you, you can draw a line between all these additional bureaucrats and better outcomes on the ground. But I'm not seeing any of that. And what you see happening instead is at a time when government's uh, hiring up it's seemingly every breathing person available, in the private sector, we're seeing job losses at the same period of time. This is not a recipe for a future success. And I think what the public is, has to understand and what I'm going to make sure the public understands is that government only exists when we get revenues generated by the private sector. The employers that hire people and the wages those folks pay, that comes into government, and that's how we're able to fund First class public services. And if we keep going in the direction the NDP is going, we're going to be right back to the 1990s before we even know it. And as I see this pandemic start to disappear behind us and become an endemic, and as people start to turn their attention back towards the economy and inflation and pressures and all the rest of those issues, I think they're going to start to look at competence and leadership. And in the case of this government, total lack of leadership and competence. And that's where uh, it's our wheelhouse. And that's where I think we'll have an opportunity to make inroads. Do you assume that John Horgan will be your opponent in 2024? Or do you think you have to prepare for someone else, maybe even sometime sooner? You know, I, really, when I think about that, I just think to myself, just uh, I've known John for many years, you know, back in my earliest days in government, he was here. He's pretty much been you know, either a staffer in this uh, uh, legislature or an MLA um, his entire adult life. And so uh, the most important thing I want for John Horgan is a full health recovery. I really mean that. You know, he's got a couple of sons. He's got a family that cares about him. And he's, you know, he's stared in the face of a very, very uh, terrifying, uh, you know, illness. And so I just want to see a speedy and full and complete recovery for John. That's the most important thing. Now, he will ultimately at some point have to make a decision about whether he wants to stay in this game with all the pressures and everything else that are involved with it or whether he might want to move on. And obviously, I would leave that decision up to him. But I want you to know this, Kirk, whether it's John Horgan or any of the other folks in that caucus, I am happy to take them on. Very happy to, actually, because uh, what they call baggage uh, anyone else in the private sector or in the real world would call accomplishments. And I'm quite happy to put my accomplishments while I was in government up against their record of non-performance, non-accomplishment, any day of the week. 
So this is a debate I'm looking forward to with whichever yeah. you know person they they happen to have as their leader. As you as you assume the party leadership, Kevin, uh, where are the gaps in in terms of the state of the party? What does it have to shore up? Do you think in in short order in order to have this election preparedness and governance preparedness? You know, uh, such a great question. Uh, and you can tell you've got some political background <laughs> because you know to ask the right questions. Uh, we have a ton of work to do. Um, this party needs, uh, and I said this again in my launch speech, I say it again today. Uh, it needs a total reboot. It needs to be re-energized, revitalized, and it needs changes. And what I mean by that is we have to make sure that this party understands that we have to be reflective of the communities that we hope to represent, both in the kind of members that we're attracting to the party and the kind of candidates we're going to recruit to run as candidates. Um, this is something that I take very, very seriously and very personally. Uh, there's a reason why my campaign co-chairs were two highly accomplished women, Diane Watts, former mayor of Surrey, and Panit Sander, who is just the uh, most unbelievable uh, immigrant success story you could ever point to. And those two represent exactly the future uh, of the party. And I'm going to make sure that I go out there and ensure that we're a diverse party, that we attract really first rate candidates. Sort of thinking back to, you know, you think about when we were in government, we were attracting people like uh, Carol Taylor, for example, Wally Opal, and others that, of that caliber that were prepared to, you know, leave, you know, private sector careers, very successful uh, careers in many cases, and come and do something for the public good. And I hope to uh, find some very strong candidates. I doubt they'll be of that caliber because they're very hard to find. But I certainly will try and find some really great people to run as candidates with us. And as the last election showed, though, I mean, the the, the Liberal Party has uh, is more or less a small city and rural party now. Yeah. What's what's the key, do you think, to try to penetrate a Vancouver or a Victoria, for instance, in order to to give you more of a beachhead in places? Well, this is why I think I, I'm uniquely qualified to be the leader, to be honest. Um, you know, a lot of people thought, oh, well, you know, he comes from the Gordon Campbell era, so that's not going to work. But let me tell you something. I represented a riding called Surrey Cloverdale for 12 years. And Surrey is the fastest growing city in this province. It will be bigger than Vancouver probably in the next five years. And the thing about Surrey is it represents exactly what the future of British Columbia is in a snapshot. You've got a huge mit mix of ethnic backgrounds. You've got all kinds of industry and business, small business, big business, everything represented in Surrey. And I used to win my riding of Surrey Cloverdale by some of the largest margins in the province. Today, it's held by the NDP. Now, I can guarantee you this, we'll win that seat back for sure. And the same with right down through the Fraser Valley. I feel very confident about that. If we do our job and make sure we come forward with the kind of bold, big idea that I'm going to be bringing forward over the next couple of years, and we do our work in attracting good, diverse uh, you know, members and candidates, um, I, I believe we'll flip a lot of those seats. But it's also going to be because I'm going to have a vision for the Lower Mainland that's going to appeal to the Lower Mainland. And this is what frustrated me for the last better part of a decade as I was in the private sector watching my former colleagues miss opportunity after opportunity to respond to what I, I could see very clearly were genuine needs out in the community. Uh, child care is one, uh, you know, because I would work, I would work with lots of young women and men that would talk about, you know, the challenge of getting child care, even at 1800 or 2000 a month, you're still having to apply to five or six places, hoping you might get into one of them. And I'm thinking, how is it possible that we're not responding to these issues in a big, bold, sweeping way. So that's why I support $10 a day daycare, in part because the feds are going to fund half of it anyhow. But we're going to do it in a smart way. We'll involve the private sector and the not-for-profits, not the NDP way, which is we don't want the private sector involved. They literally have said that, and they're going to force them to shut down, even though they're providing virtually all of the new seats that have come available in the last number of years. And they're going to turn it into a big, government-run, totally ridiculous structure that will take decades to scale and that's why we haven't seen any action even though they ran on it in 2017 they ran on it in 2020 uh you know they keep running on this and yet they're doing absolutely nothing to deliver it you you regularly refer to your party as one of the big ideas and and criticize the ndp as not being able to essentially deliver on big ideas and all that yes. but, but what i wonder about is um what's the new source of big ideas, a lot of you know, it's hard to get original thinking mm -hmm. in a public policy sense any longer. But where do you think it's going to come from? 
the, the biggest weakness, Kirk, that I see in this government, and I said this on the night of my victory speech, I said, look, it's, it's not that they're bad people because they're not. And it's not that they don't mean well, because I, I actually know that they, they do mean well and they believe they're, they're doing the right thing. The issue is they don't have the background and the experience and skill sets to understand how to manage and organize a large complex organization, which government is, and they don't know how to execute and get things done. And so that's why, you know, something like $10 a day daycare that they've been talking about for five years, still, we, we don't see it anywhere because they actually don't know what they're doing. And what they do do is the wrong way to approach it. It's going to be way too expensive, way too cumbersome, way too slow. I remember when I was in government, we said, we're going to do all day kindergarten. We had that up and running within a year. Okay. It's now, you know, standard right across this province. Um, when, when we said we were going to build a Portman Bridge and they opposed it, I, I got it built. Same with, you know, just go through it, the list, the Canada line. Another example, you, you get all this kind of opposition and all this kind of thing, but you know, you got to drive these things through and get them done. Otherwise it'll never happen. They don't know how to do that. They, they canceled a 10 lane bridge that you know very well at the Massey Tunnel, a 10 lane bridge that would be opening this summer that came in $900 million under the three and a half billion dollar budget. I'd never seen that in my time as a transportation minister, I'd never seen that kind of value proposition. And these, I, I, I'm trying to choose my words carefully because it angers me. They canceled this when they had a procurement completed and they had a bidder in place ready to go. They canceled it. And then they come up with this cockamamie idea of doing a, a, an eight lane tunnel where two of the lanes will be reserved for buses, meaning you've got the same number of commuter lanes that we already have today when you use the counterflow. So this is beyond really poor decision making. This is up in the epic stupidity range of, of bad decision making because yeah. that 10 lane bridge, in addition to everything, you know, the two dedicated bus lanes and four lanes of commuter each direction and 29 kilometers of road widening also would have included the fact that it was designed for rapid transit, Kirk. And this is what really kills me. That means we could have connected the Bridgeport SkyTrain station all the way to South Surrey in the future to help what we already know is happening in the fastest growing part of the lower mainland to deal with future growth. And they've thrown yeah. all that out the window. Now, uh, sorry, I, I've gone on long on this. I just want to end with this. Um, the good news is they'll never get that tunnel done. There's not a single engineer that can tell you it makes any sense and they will be stuck in the environmental assessment process for years. So I'm not worried about it because nothing will happen. Uh, and, but I can tell you if I become premier of this province, that stupidity stops right away. I'll dust off the plans for the bridge and get going. We've only got a couple of minutes left. I know you're pressed for time. Um, I, I can I can extend a little bit if you want, because this right. is important. okay. So so I'm, I'm sure you picked up on the last few weeks of the campaign. There were a lot of allegations thrown your campaign's way, and yes. and I wonder what you feel this has done in terms of um, planting seeds of doubt in first of all uh, the general public, but more specifically uh, the diverse cohort that you wish to attract to this party. What, what do you think has to happen here in the short term in order to uh, reset some of that, some of that impact? So I, I, I'm so glad you asked this question. Uh, and if I'm totally honest with you and I, I can't help it, that's just my nature to be candid. Um, first of all, I want you to know this. Uh, I'm a good sport winner and I'm a good sport loser. I've, I've lost uh, a, a very close leadership race and I know what it's like to lose and it's not fun. And I think that the candidates have been really stand up about it. I wanna be clear about that. But I also want you to know there's a lot of silliness and allegations that get made in the heat of a leadership campaign. Candidly, especially among people that know they're losing. And my big problem is this. If people are gonna make allegations, they need to back them up. Now there was a lawsuit that was filed by Vikram Bajwa and mm -hmm. making a whole bunch of allegations. And I said at the time, I think it's frivolous. I'm not gonna spend five minutes thinking about it. I encourage you to read the judgment by the judge because they just absolutely not just threw it out, but said costs are gonna be awarded to the party because it really right. rose to the extent of total frivolousness. And what you have to understand about our leadership race is this, it is much harder to vote in this leadership race than it is in a general election, much harder. You not only have to become a member, but you have to become a member with a, a definable credit card. So every individual has to be a real person. It's not like the old days where you can pay in cash or you can get those temporary credit cards. None of that is allowed. Then when you become a member, that's just the start of the process. 
then the government, the, the sorry, the, the party is going to send you a code, a special code that you have to hang on to for several weeks before the actual vote. Then on the day of the two days of voting, you have to submit that code to get another PIN number. And then when you have that PIN number, only then can you vote when you uh, put in your postal code, they confirm your identity, and then you're allowed to vote. Now, this is complex even for people like you and I. But imagine if you're a South Asian or Chinese voter, that it maybe English isn't your first language. And maybe you haven't got you know quite the fluidity with this kind of a process that some of us might find it a little more intuitive, though I found, frankly found it to be complex even for, for folks like us. Um, and you can understand how challenging that can be. So a lot of the allegations that were made were innuendos, like, oh, his campaign must be doing something wrong with the people they're signing up. No, it is not unusual for people to say uh, when they put in an address, they put in their business address. That is not fraud. That is someone making a mistake and saying, I usually get my mail to my business. And so they use it or they don't use an email address or they use one email address for the six people in their homes. Now, you and I, Kirk, might not live in a home with six, nine or ten people. But I can tell you, I can take you to Surrey and introduce you to a lot of my friends that have been friends of mine for 20 years. They have families in their homes. And they should not be discriminated against because they have a different lifestyle and a different way of living with a multi-generational family. And I can tell you, in a lot of this, people that don't know those communities, including the Chinese community, some people don't know that uh, in Mandarin-speaking spe uh, population, they have different last names, the husbands and wives. That's very common too. That is an automatic red flag for our auditing process. And mm -hmm. imagine if you're a member of this party and you've been a member for 15, 20 years and you're voting in maybe your third or fourth leadership race and every single time you get singled out as part of the auditing process to say, hey, you know what, Kirk? We want to check again to make sure you're real. And I'll guarantee you this, it doesn't happen to too many of us Caucasian members, but it definitely happens to a lot of the South Asian and Chinese and they're getting a little bit tired of it. And so you yeah. see, I'm a bit passionate about this because yeah, I no, find that there's an undercurrent here that I don't yeah. like. Yeah, I can certainly tell. I mean, it, obviously that lawsuit at the last minute um, was dependent on anecdotes and, and clearly was, was wiped by the courts. But as you know, I mean, the other campaign managers in this uh, claim to have more tangible things. What I, I guess what I wonder about is how do you think this has had an impact on... <laughs> On your new leadership and your effort in order to broaden the tent here is, is do you start with a little bit of a of a, a fence mending or a, a you know reconciliation that has to take place inside your ranks in order to then be the effective leader you want to be? Yes, and um, I that's why I said on my victory speech um, that you know I, I and I genuinely mean this. We've been through a very long campaign, longer than any leadership campaign race I can ever remember. It makes no sense to have a race this long, but nevertheless, that's what it is. And I can tell you, uh, you know, as someone that went through 10 months, some of the others, frankly, were, were doing it for much longer. Um, you know, it's a stressful process and, and you're doing it in the midst of a pandemic and all the challenges and leaving family and everything. So I was very clear that, that bygones be bygones. That's, it, it's, it's, all, it's behind me right now. I forgive and forget everything. But, but you know, you, you just, you raised that issue and does it hurt us? Yes, frankly, it wasn't helpful. I, I'd be less than honest if I said it was really helpful to have to go through that and have that sort of innuendo out there. And that's why in the debates and that's why in radio programs and stuff, I said, well, bring forward the evidence. Don't go and whisper to people and say, oh yeah, there's all this stuff going on, blah, blah, blah. If there is, get it out there because mm -hmm. we deserve to see what it is. And so that, yeah. that's, what, that's what kind of frustrated me. But you know what, that's all in the past right now. And what I'm really pleased about is all three of the MLAs that, that ran um, all have prominent critic roles now and have been very, very good about saying, look, we're all in this together and let's move forward together. There will still be hurt feelings. There always is, you know, and, and uh, but but I think I've been impressed with their character and their ability to say, OK, it's behind. Let's move on this together. We've all got a common goal. And that is that the NDP are really the uh, the ones we need to focus attention on. Okay, so we're in extra time here at the soccer match, uh, and I, I'm cognizant of your time. Uh, two last things, okay, if you don't mind. Um, you did, you have talked from the outset about a rebrand of the party, a renaming of the party. Um, have you figured out the process yet to get you from here to there? Yeah, so I'm on day two. 
Um, but but here's what I have said. I said, I will do it on two conditions. Number one, we can find a name that makes some sense. Uh, and number two, that we can make sure that legally there's not going to be an, an issue with someone borrowing the BC Liberal name and then trying to be mischievous by running candidates and confusing people. And so, so I want to deal with those two things as fast, as fast as we can. And then I want to be able to go to the membership and say, look, here's a name or a couple of names as suggestions that we think we could look at as an alternative to the existing name as part of a rebrand and re-energizing and rebooting of this party. What do you think? And if they agree that that's the way to go, bang, we'll go there. And if they don't, for whatever reason, that's fine too. We'll, we'll stick with what we got and we'll go ahead. Because at the end of the day, I don't want to get hung up on the name. I do think it's an issue for a lot of people out there. There is brand confusion. But, you know, I think the power of our ideas and, and messaging is going to be much more important at the end of the day. So we'll see. How okay. It goes. All right. So uh, th this is a question that I'll ask and I'll, I'll finish it, uh, finish the interview with it. And uh, we can kind of uh, keep the recording uh, fresh for some time in the future. Okay. Um, Complete this sentence. If I were elected premier, the first thing I would do is? I deal with the healthcare system because as I've crossed the province, it, it is a mess and I'm very, very concerned about it. The level of, uh, uh, of dismay, discouragement, uh, et cetera, about how the government is running the system is the worst I've ever seen. And it's not just the pandemic. I wanna be clear about that because you would expect some sense of tiredness and fatigue, et cetera, as a result of the uh, pandemic, but it goes much deeper than that. So I think, uh, you know, healthcare is going to be a big issue. But, you know, the other things I talked about, making sure that we get $10 a day childcare done, done quickly, it's going to be a big part of it. Housing affordability, hugely passionate issue for me. I think it would be refreshing to have a premium that actually understands the housing market. Uh, that, that, you know, the NDP, I mean, we've got David Eby secretly meeting with the developers at UDI for the last six months trying to understand the industry. Give them credit for that because it'd be nice if they knew what they were doing because clearly they don't. They've loaded on a ton of new taxes and new costs. Housing prices have never been higher in the five years that the NDP have been in government. It's been a total disaster from a policy point of view. So I will change that. It's something I feel strongly about, big changes, and we'll have to have a separate uh, uh, talk about that. Um, and some of the other things I've talked about, mental health and addictions too. I just think that our streets are getting less safe, uh, becoming increasingly more of a social disorder and chaos. And the NDP keeps doing more of the same, hoping for different results and it will not work. Okay, so what do you do in your second day? Um, anyway, that's, that's, um, good talking to you. Uh, let you go. I know you're you're a busy guy today, um, and I uh, hope you come back, uh, talk quite regularly to us here, and uh, give us a sense of how your own evolution as a leader. Oh, by the way, and last thing, are are you going to be one of these uh, opposition guys who just says no, no, no to everything across the aisle? No. Are you going to be one of those? No, no, I'm not. And, and this is a, you know, this is where there's a little bit of almost education to the public that they need to understand that our most important role, our job actually, is to be the official opposition. That means we have to oppose what government brings forward. But when government does something right, we will say they've done something right. And, you know, I've said that before, when they move forward on the, uh, the Site C project, something I was very strongly in favor of and was started by a BC Liberal government, I was very supportive. I, like, I thought that was a great decision, for sure. Now, how they mismanaged it and caused the budget to double is a whole nother issue, but put that aside for a minute. I think the moving ahead with it made a lot of sense. Our caucus, I think, is, is to be really applauded for the fact that we have largely supported the government and its efforts as we've gone through this pandemic. We've supported Dr. Bonnie Henry, we've supported uh, a lot of the uh, decisions that have been made around mandates and all the rest of it. Um, and I think we can be proud of that too. But when they are on the wrong track, we will have no hesitation in saying they are, and we will offer an alternative. That's something you will hear from me, not just complaining, but you'll also hear where we want to go. So, Okay. Well, we've gone into extra time, penalty kicks, and uh, the fans are leaving, leaving the stadium pretty quickly here, <laughs> Kevin. So, uh, thanks a lot for your time today. Good to see you. Thanks. Thanks so much, Kirk. Really appreciate it. We'll do it again. Yeah. Kevin Falcon, the new leader of the official opposition. I'm Kirk LaPointe, publisher and editor-in-chief of BIB. Thanks a lot for watching.